Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Karen Koch. I'm with the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, a member organization of the Migrant Rights Network, um, cross-country coalition of migrant-led organizations. Um, and we are hosting this press conference today to talk about the new um, program pathway to permanent residency that was announced by the federal government on April 14th. We are just going to wait a few minutes um, to let some new folks to let folks arrive. Um, we will be uh, starting at about 1105. Um, in the meantime, we will be asking for media who is present. If you have a question to please use the Q&A function. If you can identify yourself by your name and outlet and type in your question. Uh, and then after the speakers have gone, we will call on you, uh, ask you to unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, we will be having a few speakers today, two speakers with translation. Um, so we will ask you to leave time to wait for the worker to speak and then translation will be provided at the end. Um, so as I said, we'll just get started in a couple of minutes. Welcome everyone and we'll be with you shortly. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, for those just arriving, we're just gonna give another couple of minutes for other registered participants to arrive. Um, so we'll be starting in about two minutes. Um, for media who's arriving, um, we'll be uh, laying out the list of speakers just in a second. Um, and if you have any questions, we will be asking you to please put them in the Q&A, identifying yourself by name and uh, outlet. And we'll be starting in just a moment. Hi everyone, good morning and welcome. My name is Karen Koch. I'm with the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. We are a member organization and the secretariat of the Migrant Rights Network, uh, the country's largest coalition of migrant led groups. And we are here today to uh, talk about the new permanent residency program that was announced by the federal government on April 14th. Since in the two weeks uh, since that government announcement, we have been, uh, distributing a tool for migrant and undocumented people to use to determine whether or not they qualify for permanent residency through that program. And today we will be talking about what that tool has shown us about the number of people who are excluded, the people who will not be able to apply for permanent residency through this program. And we are here today to hear from some of those very migrant and undocumented people about why they are excluded uh, and demanding that all migrant and undocumented people in Canada be given access to permanent resident status. So a little bit about um, the agenda for today's press conference. So we have a number of speakers today. Um, uh, a couple of the speakers require translation. Um, we will be dropping the names, the full spelling, the names and the organizational affiliation of the speakers in the chat. 
Um, for those speakers requiring translation, we will have uh, the person speaking, um, delivering their full statement, and then translation, a full translation will come at the end. So we ask you to please wait until the end to hear the English translation. For media, we will ask you to please place your questions in the Q&A box and identify yourself by name and outlet. And after our speakers, we will um, come to you for questions and I will ask you to unmute yourself. This uh, press conference is being, re being recorded and will be made available um, on YouTube and on our website. Um, after the press conference is complete, um, the report, the full report that we are going to be discussing today is available at the link that was just dropped in the chat. And uh, the press release is also available there for your use. Our list of speakers today, we will begin with Syed Hassan of the Migrant Rights Network Secretariat and Executive Director of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So I, I wanna begin by just <clears throat> taking us back to June 14th, 2020, 10 months ago, when, the, when, when migrant and undocumented people from across the country launched a campaign for full and permanent immigration status for all. This has been a call for migrant and undocumented people for many decades, but this latest campaign was launched as a result of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, which caused a human rights catastrophe in migrant and undocumented communities. And just 10 months later to the date on April 14th of this year, the federal government announced this program. And it comes at the heels of this campaign that is being led by migrant and undocumented people directly that says we need permanent resident status. Permanent resident status is crucial because it is the mechanism by which migrants can assert the rights that they do have and access rights that everyone deserves. Without permanent resident status, for many people, it's not even possible to get healthcare, including COVID-19 testing and vaccines. Without permanent residency status, it is not possible for many people to speak back against a bad boss or to protect themselves uh, when they are being discriminated against. Permanent resident status is crucial because without it, migrants are dying. We are aware right now that at least six migrant farm workers have died this year, and at least six international students have committed suicide as a result of financial and immigration pressures. Permanent resident status for all is a matter of life and death. It is the mechanism through which migrants can protect themselves, and it is essential for a free and equal society. If we want fairness, we need everyone to have equal rights, and it is not possible to have equal rights if people in the country have different immigration status. Since this announcement was made on April 14th, the Migrant Rights Network has reached out to our membership and nearly 4,000 people have responded via an online survey tool. It is crucial to understand that we are, the Migrant Rights Network is currently Canada's largest and only migrant led body. And it's clear that we can speak to thousands of people in a matter of weeks. This means that the federal government needs to sit at the table with us to determine what the future of immigration should look like. And many of the problems that we will outline today would not have happened were it not for the federal government to, to actually reach out and speak to migrants and undocumented people directly. We are sharing what we learned over the last two weeks in the form of a report. That report has been dropped along with the press release in the chat so you can access it. The first section of the report calls the need for transformative action right now. Canada is facing a generational opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity to change the way immigration has been working for the last 20 years. We have seen a 615% rise in temporary work permits over the last 20 years. We have seen this blooming and mushrooming of migrant and migrant undocumentedness that as a result, three times more people enter the country on temporary status than they do as permanent residents. Many of those people at one point or the other cannot renew their permits and become undocumented. And, my, and without permanent resident status, people don't have access to basic labor rights, have not access to healthcare. And this is a moment when we, when we can make that change. And what we need is a wholesale transformation, not this one off short term window that excludes many. The second section of the report details exclusion. The program that was announced on April 14th excludes directly all undocumented residents, all students, all refugees, 
and all temporary migrants in Quebec. That is together 1.18 million people that are immediately excluded who deserve and need permanent residence. These are essential members of our community. They deserve permanent residence to protect themselves. And if we do not provide permanent residence to everyone, then we do not ensure rights and protection for everyone. You can't have public health care when potentially one in 23 people don't have a health card or may not be able to access health care. You can't have minimum labor protections when one in 23 people can be exploited more by a boss. Also, this program excludes people on the basis of two for, of, of inadmissibility, which includes medical inadmissibility. That is, if you or anyone in your family is, is deemed too sick to be in Canada or too disabled, then you are not able to apply through this program. The program also excludes people on the basis of criminal inadmissibility. We know that many racialized people, particularly black community, has been over-targeted and over-policed. Many people have criminal convictions for things like cannabis, which has since been de um, decriminalized in the country and legalized in the country, but those charges will make it impossible for people to be able to uh, apply through this program. The third section of the report is disappointment. When this program was initially launched, there was this complete, there was this moment of belief that finally there would be a path for low wage workers, NOC C and D workers as they're commonly known to be able to apply for permanent resident status, which generally has not existed in the Canadian immigration system. However, because of the other requirements, many people will not be able to apply and disappointment and grief and despondency is setting in. We heard from our members more than one in three survey respondents who are in the international graduate stream and nearly half in the essential worker stream do not have English results. And without those English test results, they will not be able to apply. We also heard that a quarter of essential workers don't have the 12 month work experience uh, that is deemed essential within the specific occupations that the federal government has announced. And nearly 14% do not have work permits. The reason for this is that many migrant care workers, farm workers and other essential workers are on employer dependent work permits. And when they are working, and when they lose those jobs or when they are kicked out of those jobs or pushed out of those jobs or when they have to leave jobs because of exploitation, they can't begin a new job and they can't actually assess, um, and when they can't access these new jobs, they simply aren't able to count the hours that they are working towards this application. We also saw that 13.6% of, of the people who responded in the international graduate stream and 6.3% uh, in the essential worker streams do not currently have a job, which is one of the requirements to apply for this job. This has made workers scramble to find any job at any wage to qualify for this program. Now, those on employer restricted permits who are laid off or left bad employers are forced to return to those bad employers if they are going to be able to apply for this program. Not, and it is, it is crucial to understand what this requirement is. Today, if you are on any kind of parental leave, or even sick leave uh, because of COVID-19, you have to return to work to be able to apply for this program. At least 461,000 people are more are eligible at, at the front end for this program if they meet all the, of the other requirements, but there are only 90,000 spots. The first 90,000 get in and everyone else is excluded. This has caused immense chaos, which is the final section of our report. As we show and as we outline, English test centers are closed. Uh, when this program was announced, in fact, the two major sites, IELTS and Selfib websites crashed. And not only did they crash, um, there are too few appointments available, sometimes many months in the future. Now, many migrants, particularly farm workers, domestic workers, other low wage workers are living in employer provided housing, employer controlled housing, and can't leave those spaces to even go get a test. Those in rural communities have to travel long distances and can't take days off. Another form of chaos and exploitation that we're seeing is the, uh, is the immense power that employers have gained as a result of this announcement. With the need for being currently in a job so crucial and showing how many people don't have uh, current employment and noting that racialized unemployment is at a historic high in Canada, migrants are willing to take any job at any pay just to be able to get permanent resident status. And because self-employment and gig work is also not excluded, people are forced to um, take jobs. This has resulted in, uh, as I mentioned, migrant workers needing to return to bad jobs uh, that they may have left before. 
The regulations also require for an applicant to be in Canada. Now, Canada has closed its borders to many migrants and flights are currently shut off to Mexico, Caribbean, India, and Pakistan. As a result, migrants who were visiting their families to take care of their health needs or migrants who are abroad um, for some other reason and not able to return are needing to travel multiple countries uh, putting themselves at greater risk of COVID just to get to the country in time and paying huge sums of money to do so. This of course means that people who are from Western countries, where, places where the border is open, like the United States and Europe, have an unfair advantage in this program. Similarly, there has been no information provided by the federal government since the announcement on April 14th, which has seen a, a massive explosion of unscrupulous immigration lawyers and consultants charging huge sums of fees that simply will not result in people getting permanent residence and people are being ripped off because they are desperate. Now these high fees is actually across the board. It, it will cost a minimum of $2,000 for a family of um, two parents and two children to apply. In addition, you will have to pay for an immigration consultant, medical fees, uh, and you'll need to potentially get police certification, renew your documents. Many low wage workers simply do not have this money saved up um, for an announcement. And because you need to pay at the time you apply, people who don't have the money uh, are at an unfair disadvantage and people who do will be able to get to the front of the line. And this is a first come first serve program. Similarly, documents are required from, and, these do, and so for countries where COVID-19 has uh, caused a major catastrophe where bu government bureaucracies have shut down or embassies have shut down, renewing your documents or accessing them is much more difficult. It is clear that collectively this means that people who do not speak English, people who are, don't have good jobs, people who don't have money, people who are stuck abroad, primarily low wage working class essential workers are being pushed to the bottom of the line. So even if they're supposed to qualify, they will not be able to do so. In short, the federal government has, cre has created an, a short term program for just a few people that excludes many. What we need, in fact, is permanent resident status for all. We need to turn the tide towards equality and fairness so that everyone in the country is able to access labor rights, is able to get health care, is able to take care of their families, is able to get education. This program is not the solution. What it is, is it is, a, it is causing chaos and confusion. What it is, is it is giving much more power to institutions, giving money to English language testing sites, and giving more power to the bosses. We call on Canada to do the right thing, to ensure permanent residence status for all. Thousands of migrants are part of this very short-term report, very quick report, but many more are saying the same thing. This program is set to launch on Thursday. We call on the government to make specific and immediate changes to ensure that everyone in the country gets permanent residence status and everyone that arrives in the future does so with permanent residence status. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hassan. As Hassan said, this new program excludes most migrants, those who, from whom you will hear today, many of whom are in essential jobs and caring for their communities, but are denied universal health care, labor rights, and emergency support because they do not have permanent residency. And worse still, this short-term and capped program with these extensive requirements has actually made the situation of inequality and abuse worse by putting migrant and undocumented people more at risk for exploitation by employers. We don't need small one-off exclusionary pilot programs, but a full overhaul of the immigration system so that every resident in the country has permanent resident status and therefore the same access to labor rights, healthcare, and other essential services. These rights are a matter of life and death as we have seen time and again since COVID hit last year, especially amongst some of those sectors that will be excluded from this program, such as migrant farm workers and undocumented people. So next up, we will be hearing from a migrant farm worker named Gary, who is a member of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change and is working in Ontario. Gary will be reading his remarks in Spanish, followed by an English, an English translation by me. Gary, por favor a ti. Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Gary. Soy de México y estoy aquí en Canadá desde el 2013, enero del 2013. Estoy trabajando con una empresa que se dedica a atrapamiento de pollos. Y bueno, yo tengo 
como una historia media, dura. Cuando me vine de México, tuve que dejar a mi mamá recién operada de una cirugía. Un año estuvo en cama, no la vi. Y pues ella se dependía sola con una vecina, le llevaba de comer, la, la atendía, mientras yo estaba trabajando aquí. Y pues con el nuevo programa que está ahora, me voy a estar excluido porque... El, es muchos requisitos, nos piden un examen de inglés y pues lamentablemente en mi caso, que no soy único, somos varios compañeros que estamos trabajando en el sistema, que este, este examen es demasiado caro, son 300 dólares y pues la verdad hay unos que sabemos usar computadora, hay unos que no sabemos usar una computadora y es demasiado estricto, hay muchas condiciones que pide el programa para poder hacer la aplicación para la residencia permanente. He este, comentado con algunos compañeros, unos me dicen, oye, pero si ya estamos acá más de ocho años, yo llegué desde el 2013, estamos más de ocho años, más de diez años, nos piden un examen. Si hemos sobrevivido aquí en Canadá durante ocho, diez años, eso nos... Hemos trabajado con ese inglés. No necesitamos una certificación. Es lo que he platicado con unos compañeros. Y en mi caso, es eso. que ¿Cómo me piden un examen con un nivel 4? Que nosotros aprendemos aquí por necesidad y hemos sobrevivido durante 8 o 10 años trabajando con el inglés que sabemos. Yo siento que por eso me voy a quedar fuera del, del programa. ¿Me vas traduciendo? sigo y este eso es lo que tengo aparte todo lo yo he consultado varios abogados porque para mí es algo difícil leer todo lo de las aplicaciones eso he consultado con unos abogados cuál es el costo para que pudieran hacer mi aplicación y son elevadísimos los costos va de 5 mil a más de 10 mil dólares por aplicación Aparte, vienen los costos de traducción, la aplicación que son mil, mil dólares para el gobierno de la aplicación, examen, eh, examen médico, eh, exa, este, las huellas digitales, ese es costo extra, todos esos costos son extras. Nosotros ganamos el, sal, el salario mínimo aquí. Tenemos que mandar a nuestras familias en México. Y es, es demasiado, es, es demasiado caro para lo que nos están pidiendo. Y yo digo que, que para la residencia, para todos, pedimos que se nos quite el examen de inglés. Hemos estado aquí trabajando durante mucho tiempo y merecemos por humanidad, porque no soy yo, somos muchos los que hemos perdido en el camino, mucha familia, hemos perdido padres, hemos perdido hijos, hemos perdido esposas. ¿Por qué? Porque no tenemos un, una salud digna en nuestros países. Nosotros sí estamos acá, trabajamos, sabemos sufrir, porque sabemos sufrir, somos gente de trabajo. Únicamente que nunca nos piden, nunca nos han preguntado, oye, ¿y tu familia? Nosotros estamos acá, estamos trabajando, estamos produciendo dinero. No mandamos el 100% de dinero, porque tenemos que pagar aquí nuestros gastos. Tenemos una familia en nuestros países. Algunas veces nos han muerto padres, se nos han muerto familiares, por no tener una, una salud digna, por falta de un oxígeno, por falta de un medicamento, se nos van, porque no tenemos eso, algo que nos respalde. Y nosotros pedimos por humanidad la residencia permanente para todos, para que así nosotros podamos brindar salud a nuestros familiares, segura, que aquí la salud es gratis, pero no tan gratis porque nosotros... Damos impuestos al gobierno. Nosotros podemos exigir, pedir por humanidad nuestra residencia permanente para todos, porque la necesitamos. Hemos estado trabajando aquí muchos años. Hemos sacrificado nuestros años más productivos acá en Canadá. Y solo nuestros años productivos nos vamos y es todo lo que podemos hacer. Y en el camino perdemos nuestras familias, nos perdemos momentos la unidad familiar, o sea, es mucho que conlleva. Gracias. Gracias, Karen. 
My name is Gary. I am from Mexico. I came to Canada in 2013 as a temporary foreign worker. I am a chicken catcher. I have not seen my family since I left Mexico in 2013. I left behind my siblings and my mother who was recovering from surgery and is still ill and is now depending on neighbors to feed her. I'm excluded from the government's permanent residency program because I cannot pass the English test. The costs are prohibitive. Some of us migrant farm workers know how to use computers and some don't. My coworkers say, if we have survived here working in English for years, why do we now need to do a test? Many of us have had to teach ourselves English to get by while working in Canada. This is not fair. We have built lives here and we have missed out on our lives with our families and even lost loved ones back home. All the costs of applying, of applying to this program are barriers to us. The English test costs almost $300. The application costs over a thousand, plus getting documents translated, getting medical exams, paying for lawyers or legal help, some of whom are charging between $5,000 and $10,000. We make minimum wage here. This is impossible for us. We can't apply for this program or the agri-food pilot because the requirements exclude us. And it makes us even more dependent on employers because we need job offers to apply. We send money home to our families, but it's never enough since being here is expensive and it doesn't only cost us money. We want to be with our families. Many of my coworkers have left partners and kids for years. Some have had to leave their wives behind while they are still pregnant. In these temporary programs, we can't complain because we are afraid. We cannot stand up for our rights because the employers always threaten us saying they won't renew our contracts or that they will deport us. We are at the employer's disposal. And if we aren't, we get threatened. Because of our humanity, we deserve permanent residency status. Because we have sacrificed for so many years away from our families, living in bad conditions. We have lost wives, husbands, children, family. What about our families? We deserve a life with dignity. We have put ourselves at risk during this pandemic. In order for us to be able to defend our rights, we need permanent residency. The pandemic has brought to light the reality of these temporary immigration programs. This is why we need permanent residency with no requirements like English exams to be able to protect ourselves and defend our rights. And that is why we are demanding status for all. Next, we will be moving to Abdul an undocumented organizer with Solidarity Across Borders based in Montreal. Abdul will be speaking in French, followed by English translation. Abdul, allez-y s'il vous plaît. Bonjour tout le monde. Alors moi, c'est Abdul. Je suis membre de Solidarité sans frontières. Je suis exclu du programme, du nouveau programme simplifié à l'immigration car le Le gouvernement de Justin Trudeau pense que nous, les sans statut, nous ne méritons pas actuellement et ne sommes pas assez, disons, méritants de faire partie de ce programme. Et pourtant, on se lève à tous les jours, les matins, qu'il fasse chaud ou qu'il fasse froid, pour aller travailler. Ce programme, pour moi, est très injuste car il vient encore, en quelque sorte, creuser le fossé qui existe déjà entre les sans statut et le reste de la population. Le gouvernement Trudeau a manqué à travers cette occasion de réparer toutes les injustices, toutes les souffrances, de restaurer la dignité des sans statut. Alors, pour moi, tout le monde, je dis bien, tout le monde a droit à la dignité. Tout le monde a droit de se loger de façon convenable. Tout le monde a droit de se soigner et cela, quelles que soient les origines ou le statut de la personne. Nous avons vu qu'avec l'arrivée de la pandémie, les sans statut ont connu de, de net d'énormes difficultés, notamment pour se loger, pour se vêtir, puis Le gouvernement de M. Trudeau avait l'occasion, à travers ce programme, d'inclure tout le monde et de venir corriger ces problèmes. Je suis arrivé ici au Canada en 2015 pour des études et après, j'ai perdu mon statut. Depuis, j'enchaîne toutes sortes de jobs, que ce soit dans la construction, les entrepôts, le déménagement, 
avec des conditions de travail évidemment qui sont inhumaines. Les employeurs traitent les gens comme ils veulent. Donc, c'est pourquoi je pense qu'il n'est pas encore tard pour le gouvernement fédéral de rectifier le tir. Car pour nous, c'est une question, ce n'est pas une question juste de voir qui est qualifié ou pas, c'est une question de vie ou de mort. C'est pourquoi nous, nous demandons aujourd'hui, à, à travers Solidarité sans frontières, un statut pour tout le monde, et cela sans exception, que ce soit les, les, les étudiants internationaux, que ce soit les, les travailleurs temporaires, que ce soit les personnes sans statut, que ce soit les demandeurs d'asile ou n'importe quelle autre personne se trouvant dans une situation précaire, nous demandons à ce que le gouvernement de M. Trudeau nous présente un programme inclusif dans lequel tout le monde se reconnaîtrait. Et pour terminer, j'aimerais profiter de cette occasion pour informer tout le monde de la marche que Solidarité sans frontières organise de Montréal à Ottawa du 18 au 25 juillet pour aller demander à toutes les autorités fédérales, que ce soit au Parlement ou au gouvernement de M. Trudeau, de nous proposer dans les plus brefs délais un programme de régularisation qui inclut tout le monde, toutes les couches de la population, toutes les, les couches vulnérables aujourd'hui dont on parle. Et cette marche, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, aura lieu du 18 au 25, du 18, ju du 18 au 25 juillet. Alors, merci de m'avoir écouté et bon entrevue à tout le monde. Merci, Abdul. Fred. Okay, thanks Abdul. I'm just gonna uh, briefly translate. Um, so Abdul says, hi, hi everyone, my name is Abdul. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a member of Solidarity Across Borders uh, in Montreal and I am a non-status person. I'm excluded from the program because the Trudeau government doesn't think that people without papers deserve uh, regular status and regularization. But we wake up every morning like everyone else when it's cold and when it's hot and go to work. This program is unjust because it solidifies the divide that already exists between undocumented people uh, and other uh, precarious migrants and people with, with status in Canada. Everyone has the right to exist. Everyone has the right to health care and to housing regardless uh, of their situation or, or where they're from or where they were born. We saw uh, since the beginning of the pandemic that it's very difficult for people without papers uh, to survive without any government supports, um, be that in access to housing or, or in the ability to work. Um, I arrived in Canada in 2015 as an international student, uh, then I lost my status. I've worked in every different type of job since then. I've worked in moving, in, in warehouses, I worked in construction, obviously uh, in a variety of inhuman conditions uh, because I can't defend myself. It's not too late for the government to fix this. It's not too late to make a program that can be inclusive to everyone um, regardless of their situation. That's why we in Solidarity Across Borders are calling for status for all, no exceptions for people uh, making, for asylum seekers, for international students, for people without papers, for everyone. Um, and I want to take this, this, uh, this opportunity to announce um, to everyone here that uh, from at the 18th to the 25th of July, uh, Solidarity Across Borders will be organizing a march from Montreal to Ottawa uh, to bring this message to federal decision makers uh, and to call for uh, a program of regularization for status for all immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Abdul. As Abdul said, it is uh, not fair that people who are forced out of status because of the immigration itself are now being denied access to permanent residency and are being put 
at most risk during a pandemic for exploitation, the lack of access to healthcare. The next speaker that we will be moving to is Sherry Ann Snag. Sherry Ann is a migrant care worker with the Caregivers Action Center and Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. She is in Toronto. We have had to take a video of Sherry Ann's remarks because she was unable to take any time off work today to be here with us. My name is Sherry Ann Snag. I came to Canada as a living caregiver and I am excluded from the new PR program simply because of an English exam. This is unfair because I'm coming from an English speaking country and English is the only language I speak. It is the only language I use to communicate with the children I take care of and the employers I work for. But why does it matter what language we speak anyway? English is not a requirement to get a job. We are getting employment and are working very hard, regardless of what language we, we come into this country with. We are making contributions to this country and have been since we arrived. The only thing we don't have is our freedom. And the only way for all of us to be free is to have permanent residency status. When I first arrived in Canada in 2017, I was eager to work hard to meet the requirements to get permanent residency and have my family join me. I worked hard. Many times I did extra work in the evenings and weekends for no overtime pay. I was never paid public holiday pay. When my employers traveled, I would travel with them so that they could have fun on their vacation. While they vacationed, I worked and I worked diligently. I raised their two children like they were my own because I was part of the family. But then I got sick. I got sick during the lockdown and was unable to work. While on my sick bed, I was called up and told that my services were no longer needed and had to leave immediately that afternoon. I was a living caregiver, so I had nowhere to go. I was homeless and also I had a closed work permit. And so I lost the benefits that came with it, such as healthcare, income, housing, and financial security for myself and my family back home. Since losing my job, it's been very hard. I've been searching for a job, trying to find an employer to sponsor me so that I can finish the three months needed to complete my 24 months for PR under the home child care provider pilot program. But just this past week, the cap for this PR program was reached, which means another door has been closed for me and my fellow care workers. My only chance of getting PR is through this new pathway program. Without permanent residency status, you are pushed around. You are pushed around by employers and by the government. If they are giving us something, just give it, but don't give it and say, but you need all of this. Don't give it with restrictions and limitations. We are all here and we are working hard and deserve to be treated as human beings with human rights. In a time like this with a country on lockdown, it is impossible to book an exam before the new program commences. And this is putting a lot of us in a very hopeless position. It is also disheartening to our families who are sacrificing the joy and comfort of not having us around as we search for a better life. And every time that better life is escaping our grasp. Why do I have to do an English exam to be reunited with my children? Why do I have to do an English exam to get basic human rights? This is discrimination and exploitation. I join with my fellow migrants to demand a status for all now. A thank you to Sherry Ann who was able to record that statement for us. Um, as Sherry Ann said, 
again, for people like her, who, for whom the immigration system itself pushed them out of status and because of the impossible requirements to be able to get permanent residency through the caregiver programs, Sherry Ann has been left without a home, without work, without the ability to legally work and no access to healthcare, which means that Sherry Ann can also not apply for this new PR pathway program and that it has put Sherry Ann's health at risk. It is for this reason that migrant workers and undocumented people are saying that requirements, limitations and exclusions on access to permanent residency, increase exploitation and abuse are dangerous to people's health, are unjust and will cost lives. Next up, we will be hearing from Aidulu, who is a migrant student. She is with Migrant Students United and the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. Aidulu, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aidulu. I'm a member of uh, Member Students United, as Karen said. I'm a former international student who is now on a postgraduate uh, work permit. Uh, I graduated uh, from a one-year certificate program at uh, George Brown College in Toronto. And sadly, is I'm not eligible for the new PR pathway uh, programs because my school uh, was 12 months. So I'm uh, one of uh, more than a million migrants and who are excluded. And because of these uh, rules, uh, the I believe, uh, and this situation is. Um, uh, unfair and we are all uh, essential and deserve full uh, permanent immigration status status for all. As an uh, international student, I paid three times more in tuition fees uh, than other students in COVID time. I paid my taxes and bills even though I was in uh, financial uh, difficulty and uh, couldn't get support from uh, my, my family because of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we are uh, facing uh, really tough uh, conditions here and COVID-19 has made our situation uh, even harder. These new policies uh, do not cover the majority of struggling uh, people like myself. Um, and as migrants, and we have been uh, doing all the essential work and that keeps our communities alive and during the pandemic, uh, and also we are putting ourselves at risk. All of us uh, deserve uh, permanent residence status and so that we have dignity and can protect uh, ourselves. So uh, I would like to mention about my journey. So it's, it's not, it has not been easy. And after COVID-19, uh, erupted. Everything has been uh, tough to be handled. And I came to Canada in September 2019 to study in the Career Development Practitioner Program at George Brown College in Toronto. Uh, it was, an, uh, as I said, it was a one-year program in the second semester, and we had to transition to the online schooling because of uh, COVID-19. But our tuition fees uh, stayed the same. Uh, my family back home was hit hard uh, by the pandemic and couldn't provide any uh, financial support anymore. And while studying, I, uh, while studying and I work at uh, low clothes at night and I stock shelves and I was carrying uh, heavy boxes and replenishing products. And even uh, I was bullied by supervisor and uh, I work in very tough conditions, uh, almost nine hour shifts at night time. So I needed to, uh, because I needed to pay my rent and also tuition fees, uh, my school didn't provide me any uh, option. And they said, and you cannot, uh, uh, I cannot graduate unless I pay. Uh, it was really uh, tough times and my uh, physical and mental health was affected badly. And after the graduation, uh, luckily I found a job in uh, my field as an employment specialist at one of the employment service providers uh, funded by the government and was offered a full-time permanent position. But my temporary status is the major hindrance for my career uh, growth here. Uh, my postgraduate work permit is limited to one year and it will expire in this December and it's, uh, it is a non-renewable permit. And these are the impossible uh, conditions that migrants uh, like me and have to face. So it doesn't have to be uh, like this. And uh, so 
that's why we are calling for the government to expand uh, new program and ensure permanent uh, resident status for all of us. Um, we will always um, speak up and look for our rights uh, we deserve like others. So yeah, I, would, uh, I wanted to share my uh, story. Thank you for pro providing a space and to share my story. Thank you. Thank you, Aidalu. As Aidalu said, for migrant student workers who are paying extremely high tuition fees, who have limits on how much they can work on a study permit, who have limited access to work permits after they graduate, and who have been severely impacted by job losses, uh, by the economic circumstances of COVID-19, as well as for their families back home, the situation is dire and makes it very difficult for them to be able to access PR through this current program. In addition, the situation is just as bad, if not worse, for students who returned home during the pandemic uh, to study online remotely and who are now, because of border closures and travel restrictions, have not been able to return and will not be able to apply for the program because a person must be in Canada to be able to do so. Again, reiterating that the requirements, the exclusions, the restrictions and the rules exclude too many people, the vast majority of people who deserve full access to full rights and full equality through permanent resident status for all. Our next speaker will be Lisa. Lisa is a refugee. She is a member of Butterfly Asian and Migrant Sex Worker Support Network in Toronto. Lisa will be speaking in Mandarin followed by translation in English by Hogan. Lisa, please go ahead. Woyin 也为社会贡献了很多因此我们以图性工作者和按摩师应该仍然有身份因为政府没有保护我们，我们长期处于被歧视和骚扰的底层，受到警察、种族歧视和过分的查牌。工作不分贵贱，我们姐妹不是被贩卖，我们用自己的双手养家糊口，反对歧视，反对歧视，反对
My sister and I are not traffic victims. We use our own hands to put breads on the table. No more discrimination. No more discrimination. No more discrimination. Here, we urge the government to listen to our demand, status for all. Give us the right to leave and leave us, let us live in Canada with no worries. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Hogan, for highlighting how, again, many of these exclusions leave workers out in many industries, workers who need the same rights and the same protections as everyone else and will not be able to access them without permanent resident status because they cannot qualify for this program. That is it for our speakers for today. We will move to uh, the questions. Again, um, we will ask reporters to please uh, put your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and please identify the outlet that you're with. We will move to the questions and when I call on you, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. If you can identify by name um, and your outlet and then ask your question and we will direct it um, to whoever it is that you would like to speak to. So first, uh, we have a question from Rafi Bujakanian from the CBC. Please go ahead. Thank you. My first question was for the network. It was for Syed. I was wondering if you could tell us, since it's been a couple of weeks since you first uh, spoke about the problems you're seeing with this uh, Pathways to Permanent Residency program, have you since heard any feedback from the federal government and uh, what has it been if you have heard anything? We are still waiting on the federal government and specifically Prime Minister Trudeau to do the right thing. Uh, it's not just been two weeks, as you know, it has been months and years and decades of migrants raising our voices and calling for permanent resident status for all. Uh, even before Prime Minister Trudeau was a prime minister, he wrote an op-ed in the Toronto Star saying that migrants deserve permanent residency and citizenship. Twice in his daily press briefings last year, he repeated uh, that he was aware that migrant undocumented people are facing for more hardship during COVID-19. We have seen the immigration minister, both the Canadian Parliamentary uh, Committee on Immigration as well as on uh, Human Resources, ESDC's committee, HUMA, sorry. Uh, both of them having issued reports this year as well as in previous years, outlining the necessity of ensuring um, full and permanent immigration status for all. That's what we need. That's what we need the federal government to do. The government knows what it needs to do, but it's not doing it. I think that's the key part. So there are you know, technical briefings, there are reports, there are documents that are being produced, but the central question remains unanswered. We cannot have a fair society without equal rights. We cannot have equal rights if one in 23 people don't have the same immigration status as others. Uh, and so we have not heard back. And this is why on no matter what happens on May 6th, on May 9th, we will be doing actions across the country. In June 20th, we'll be doing actions across the country. Uh, and as was just announced, a massive march of migrant and undocumented people will physically march from Montreal to Ottawa from July 18th to the 25th, calling on the federal government to do the right thing and to ensure full and permanent immigration status for all. Thank you, Hassan. Um, and I believe, um, Rafi, did you have a follow-up question that you would like to ask now or you would like to come back to it? Um, I, I can ask it now. Should I uh, just ask it in French to Abdul or should I? If you could possibly, yes. Okay. So um, it was a bit of a long question and a two-part one. So um, I, I don't know if it's possible to maybe ask Abdul the, the second part again. Um, but what I had asked was if he could describe some of the conditions to which he was subjected to in his work, as he had uh, said that they were inhumane uh, in his initial talk to us. And I had also asked him if he's, if he's able to tell us why particularly he didn't qualify for the program. And, and that part might have been lost. Okay, we'll move to the English translation and then um, maybe at the end of the press conference, we can arrange for you to speak directly with Abdul Aram to clarify that second one. Okay, Fred, you. please go ahead. Okay, uh, great. Um, so Abdul was saying um, that uh, he has hundreds of examples um, of 
of, of jobs he's worked in where he's been exploited or where others around him have been exploited. Um, he gave a few different examples. One was uh, in working in construction, climbing up ladders that were more than 30 feet high without any protection, uh, without any sort of safety gear, uh, including a, a work accident in which he fell off one of those ladders um, and injured his foot seriously. Uh, but of course, because he doesn't have the right to health care as, as an undocumented person or uh, insurance or uh, any protections, he, uh, he had to go to work anyway. Um, and he wanted to outline that it's not just because we're in a pandemic of the situation of people without papers, so undocumented uh, workers here in Canada, uh, it's difficult. Um, that in fact, this has been the case for, uh, for many, many years, people like him working, uh, working hard in difficult conditions uh, in the Canadian economy uh, and that employers generally take advantage of this uh, in order to be able to pay people less than minimum wage uh, and to not have to kind of guarantee their, their working conditions. Um, so Abdul's response to, uh, I think the second part of the question was, in, you know, it's not just my situation. It's in fact, it's a situation of mass exploitation um, creating a, a, a class of, of workers who are, who are, uh, exploited even more intensely uh, than others in Canada uh, for the benefit of employers and therefore that the, the Trudeau government needs to find uh, an inclusive situation uh, in a program that can respond to everybody's needs uh, in Canada. Thank you, Fred. For the next question, uh, we will move to Palak Mangat, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question and identify your outlet, please. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask um, about the sort of the ambition of the program that was announced itself earlier versus the reality, which uh, there seems to be a distinction between. Um, I'm curious in, you know, based off the based off this report and, um, and, the, and, and the network's, um, I guess, ongoing work, uh, you know, that this program was initially framed as being inc more inclusive than uh, previous efforts have, have been, <laughs> have been, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to be clear, um, you know, is that, is that distinction, how significant is that distinction between, you know, this is what, this is what was um, the way that the program was framed by the feds versus this is the reality. Um, and then I just had a more technical question around the, um, around potential costs. I think it was, I don't quite remember, but I think I heard costs around, uh, you know, it varies, but there's 300, for example, for to take an, uh, take an English test. Um, I'm just wondering, I know it varies probably dramatically on the person's person, like on a personal situation, but I'm curious whether the network has any rough ballpark um, or any work in that vein. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I'll, I'll respond to the two questions in order. So on the question of, is this program inclusive? So as we began and we outlined 1.18 million people at the onset, which are all refugees, all undocumented people, all students and all temporary residents from Quebec are simply excluded um, at the first step. But then in addition, yes, the program is supposed to be accessible to uh, low wage workers, for, which generally does not happen, which is that all migrant and undocumented people who, sorry, for, which is um, low wage workers. So that's the National Occupation Classification, COD. Uh, however, the way the rest of the programs can, can, um, is developed, which is the requirement for the English test, which as you heard is uh, impossible for most. And most, as we saw more than half of um, the people who filled out our survey or who were in touch with don't have those results. The, the difficulty in getting documents, uh, particularly for people from the global South, the high fees, uh, which are also impossible for many, uh, and the need to have a valid work authorization, to have 12 months of work experience, and to be currently employed. Collectively, these rules and regulations means that the lowest wage working class people, particularly those who don't speak English or French, living in rural communities, uh, etc., are will, will not be able to apply. And so, again, uh, what we see is that it does not include those who are most excluded from our communities, those who are made most vulnerable by Canadian immigration and labor laws. Uh, and so this characterization of this, you know, initially, for example, the healthcare specific program 
actually what we know now is that maybe 3000 people will be able to apply through it, right? So when the rules are created and they get smaller and smaller, too many people are excluded from, and you heard from many of them today. That is why we are calling for a completely different approach. We don't want a piecemeal program with a myriad uh, confounding and confusing and impossible to meet requirements uh, with a short window on a first come first serve basis. We need to transform our immigration system to ensure full and permanent resident status for everyone in the country at once. And then so everyone who arrives in the future does so with permanent resident status so that we're not in this place again a few years down the road. Because what's happening is the opposite. Each year more people enter the country on a temporary basis. You know. Uh, just even in the last five years, there has been a massive ups, um, upsurge, as I said, 615% of in-work permits in the last 18 years. But study permits, refugee denials is even higher. Now, in terms of the costs associated, the details of the fees have not been announced. But for a two-person family, uh, so two parents and two children, uh, we it's going to cost $2,095 just for application fees. That's the normal um, price. And that's Part of one of the things, you know, Canada charges a so-called right of landing fee, which is something that has existed for a hundred years. It was created after the Chinese railroad workers were in this country and were, um, and this thing was created simply to create a financial burden for those migrants to not be able to live in the country permanently. And that is a dark history uh, that people are always talking about, but it's actually continuing through this right of landing fee, which is, uh, which makes it so expensive. In addition, uh, if you were to take an English test, if, uh, it would be $300 or more, depending on where you applied. And then uh, application fees, um, sorry, um, getting your passports renewed or any other police certificates, they would all be extra costs on top. But I just want to say that's what we are guesstimating because the federal government is going to announce the actual program, sorry, not announce, launch the actual program on Thursday, which is when we'll know. So there is still time. There's time for the federal government to waive the fees. There is time for the federal government to say, you don't need uh, English language requirements or that at least you don't need it on the day you apply. There is time for the government to take away the need for uh, a valid status in the country or work authorization or to be working. And uh, there's time to include people in Quebec and students and undocumented people. Uh, but if it does not happen on Thursday, as I said before, we will continue to call for what is fair and just, not just for migrants, but to ensure that everyone in the country is able to access and assert the rights that they do have. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, next, we will move to uh, Elvis Nuemsi Njike from Radio Canada. Elvis, go ahead. Elvis, are you here? I think you need to unmute yourself. Elvis, go ahead. Perhaps in the interest of time, because Elvis did chat the question. Uh, oh yes, Elvis, go ahead, sorry. No, we're not able to hear um, Elvis. Okay, so we will move on to uh, the next question uh, is from Oriel Salvador. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can, go ahead. Good, thank you. So my question is, and in regards to the seasonal agriculture pro, um, worker program, I know this program is temporary in its essence, so it might not relate to the other um, cases we talked about it today, but we talked about the benefits of a permanent resident status in terms of access to healthcare, not being attached to a work permit, to a closed work permit. So this new program, how does it affect migrant workers who come to Canada through this seasonal agriculture worker program? And eventually seek to become permanent residents here. Thank you, Aurel. Um, I will pass this question on to Gary um, and I'll just translate the question into Spanish for him first. But I'll add uh, before I do that, that um, the, uh, the 
the fact of being a seasonal worker in the country does not in and of itself exclude someone from applying to this program um, because it is a cumulative one year of work experience over the past three years. But as Gary outlined in his comments earlier and will probably say again, it is all of the other barriers that effectively exclude migrant farm workers from being able to apply through this program. So I'll let him respond to those concerns. Gary, um, si estás ahí? I mean, if I'm not still muted, I, I, I'm from Spain, so I could make the question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Hola, Gary. Pues Hola. Mi, pregu mi pregunta era que este nuevo programa del que estamos hablando hoy, ¿cómo mm -hmm. afecta a las personas que vienen a Canadá con el Seasonal Agriculture Worker Program? Si le, le, les afecta positivamente, les da más opciones a conseguir el, permiso, el residente permanente o siguen habiendo trabas. Muchas Mira, gracias. Mira, sigue habiendo, habiendo trabas, principalmente por lo del examen de inglés, como les comencé, algo difícil, porque para no tener ningún estudio básico, primaria, no nos piden que estemos este, preparados. Y cuando venimos acá y queremos aplicar ahorita con el nuevo programa, nos piden una prueba de inglés con nivel 4. Habemos unos que sabemos usar la computadora y, y podemos hacer el examen, pero hay mucha gente que no tiene ni idea cómo usar una computadora. Y es contradictorio, ¿no? Nos piden no venir preparados para ser trabajadores agrícolas y nos piden un examen en nivel 4. Hay mucha gente aquí en Canadá y en México, me imagino, que saben hablar, saben escuchar, y saben expresarse, pero gente no sabe escribir, no sabe leer, pero eso es un, un, pro, un problema para todos nosotros los trabajadores, por ejemplo, para mí, que el examen está súper costoso, 300 dólares, y pues nos piden un nivel 4, y ya hemos estado aquí 8, 10, hay compañeros de más de 10 años trabajando bajo el sistema, bajo el programa de México para venirse a trabajar acá, o guatemaltecos, o gente latina, y se nos hace difícil conseguir el examen nivel 4. Gracias, Gary. Muchas so, gracias. Uh, Gary's answer was that yes, there are still barriers, the English exam principally, um, but also being familiar with computers, uh, literacy, he says, many of us can speak, comprehend, and are getting by perfectly fine in English here. Uh, we came here to work as farm workers and we were not required to have high level of English uh, or to pass the test before we came. But writing and reading is difficult for many of us. In addition, the test is very expensive for most of us working minimum wage. The CLB level four, which is the English level that is required to be able to apply for this program is too hard, even for those of us who have been here for eight or 10 years. And that's why it's important that they remove requirements like this so that they don't exclude people like us. Next, we will move to um, the next person on the list is, I believe, uh, Krista I believe from Elvis, Global News. Oh, sorry. Oh. Elvis chatted and he wanted the answer to the question. So I thought I would Go just ahead. answer that. Go ahead. Um, okay, so the question was, what do we know about the migrant workers who have died this year? Can we have more details? So what we know is that a number of workers have passed away in quarantine since the beginning of the year, some from heart attacks, others from reasons that we are not aware of. Uh, in some cases, autopsies have taken place. In some cases, uh, they have not. Uh, and this is part and parcel of what the federal immigration system is that migrant workers in particular keep dying. Uh, and there is rarely uh, any investigation. There is never a coroner's inquest. Uh, it's unclear if they had adequate access to healthcare. So we will be making more announcements and details once we've talked to the family and connected with them. I also spoke about international students who've committed suicide as a result of uh, financial and immigration pressures. This again is a constant issue, uh, six this year, but many more in the years previous. Migrant and undocumented people in the country uh, because of COVID, because of the labor conditions, because of financial pressures, because of immigration pressures are losing their lives. And we need the federal government to do the right thing to ensure a level playing field so that each and every one of us has the same access to livelihood and life as everybody else. And that means each and every one of us must have the same permanent immigration status. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. So with that, um, it is 1216. We've got a little bit over time. Uh, um, and we have uh, a number of uh, people who uh, workers who have to go and have to get back to work. So we believe we've answered all the questions. There are um, a couple that we have answered in the Q&A function specifically. Um, so please, if you want to check uh, that your uh, questions have been answered there. And we've also provided an opportunity for follow up for some people who um, wish to speak to some of the people who spoke. Uh, on our press conference today and get access to other resources and information that we've been putting out around issues of permanent status and COVID um, and vaccines. So again, I want to say a thank you uh, to all of the media who came out and to all of our speakers, to Hassan, to Gary, to Abdulu, Sherry, Anne, and Aydulu, and Lisa. Again, in the chat, we have dropped uh, the links to the report uh, and to the press release. If anyone has any further questions, you can get in touch with us at the contact information on the press release and we can arrange follow-up interviews after this. Thank you very much to everyone for coming today.